Okay, so um, oh. I'll get started. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Last session for today. I hope I can make it a bit entertaining. Uh, so my name is Tom van Katzen. I'm from the University of Brussels. That's not very far from here, a couple of tens of kilometers. So my talk is titled JavaScript Security, or JavaScript, the good, the bad, the strict, and the secure parts. So it's sort of going to be a, a rundown of different parts of JavaScript. Uh, if you feel free to interrupt me at any point, uh, I'm happy to take questions during the talk. Okay. Um, so what do I have for you today? Um, my talk is comprised of four main parts. Uh, I'll start off by introducing JavaScript and the good and its bad parts. So I don't know how many people here have no JavaScript. Okay. So. That's good that I will introduce JavaScript because it seems like some people are not familiar with the language. Um, second part of the, of the talk, I will talk about ECMAScript 5, which is the current JavaScript standard, and I will talk about uh, its support for strict mode. So this is a fairly recent thing added to JavaScript, and I'll take some time to explain what it's about. <coughs> part 3 is about a new feature upcoming in ECMAScript 6, so that's the next standard of the language, called proxies that I've been working on. I'll give a bit of uh, detail about that. It's a useful tool to express security policies. And then the last part of the talk will be about Kaha, which is a Google product uh, closely tied to secure ECMAScript. Yeah. It's a tool that you can use to safely embed third-party JavaScript on your uh, web pages. Um, I'd like to set the stage first and make sure that there are no false expectations here. So this talk is about the JavaScript language itself. And certain language dialects or certain language features that help you to enable or improve security. This talk is not about specific security exploits in JavaScript. Yeah? It's not about how you can do cross-site scripting attacks or how you should prevent cross-site scripting attacks. This is not that talk. Okay? Um, so why should you believe anything I have to say about JavaScript? Um, so uh, my daytime job is a professor of computer science at University of Brussels. Uh, my main specialization is not in security, but more in programming languages and programming language design itself. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on the ECMA TC39, that's the, the JavaScript standardization committee, let's say. And uh, back in 2010, uh, for some time, I was a visiting faculty at Google, at the Google Kaha team, so I'm fairly familiar with their uh, technology. Uh, okay, so first part of the talk is going to be about uh, the JavaScript language itself, and what's good about this language, and what's pretty bad about this language. Um, so, probably you've already heard of JavaScript, and eh? you know it's the language that's uh, powering most of our web applications today. And uh, there's some sort of preconceptions about JavaScript, and uh, to sort of give you an idea of what the typical preconceptions of JavaScript are, I'm going to show you a, a very short snippet of a uh, uh, a lightning talk by Gary Bernhardt that he showed at CodeMash 20, 2012. You might have already seen this. It's pretty, it's pretty good. Okay. So let's talk about JavaScript. <laughs> Does anyone know in JavaScript what array plus array? Is? Well, let me ask you this first. What should array plus array be? Empty array, I would also accept type error. Uh, that is not what array plus array is. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. Array plus array is empty string. <laughs> Obviously, I think that's I think it's obvious to everyone. Uh, now, what, what would array plus object be? This should obviously be type error because those are completely disparate types. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Uh, no. Close. No. Far away. It's object. <laughs> right, nicely done. Now, of course, because uh, this is plus, so you can flip the operands and the same thing comes out. So if we do, what? No, that's just an object. Uh, if you do object plus array, you get exactly the same thing, which, as you can see, you do. <laughs> and finally, uh, the only one of these that's actually true is, uh, because you know you add arrays to the empty string, that doesn't make sense. But an object plus an object is actually not a number. <laughs> so this one's actually right. And uh, exactly, right? Like, what is even going on 
And this lab, I just, I don't even understand what the person with the brain in their head would think that any of this is a good idea. <laughs> okay, okay. Enough making fun of languages that suck. Let's talk about JavaScript. <laughs> So I can warmly recommend you watch the rest of this movie. It's uh, it's pretty awesome. But um, well, so that's sort of you know the, the preconception that many developers have. You know, when when they hear about JavaScript, oh, it's this this weird, ugly, you know, scripting language. It behaves in very weird ways. And and for many, you know, it's it's actually true, as you've seen in the movie. However, uh, flash forward to 2009 when this book appeared on the scene. Uh, it's called JavaScript: The Good Parts. And it's written by Doug Crockford, Douglas Crockford, who at the time he wrote this, he was a senior JavaScript architect at uh, Yahoo. And what he did in that book, it's a very thin book. And uh, I recommend, if you've, if you've never read a book on JavaScript, this is the book to read. I can warmly recommend it. And what he does in that book is he says, well, JavaScript is this awful language. But if you just stick to these particular parts, yeah, it's actually a pretty decent programming language. You just have to know what crap you need to avoid. Okay. So what are these good parts that Crockford talks about? And what are the bad parts? I'll, I'll highlight a couple of those. Yeah. So one of the, the most excellent parts that Crockford calls out is that JavaScript has extremely good support for functions. And actually, yeah, it's been discovered that you can do actually pretty good functional programming in JavaScript. Yeah. In JavaScript, you can just write down your functions. They are first class values. You can assign them to variables. You can create functions that return functions. So you can have higher order functions. And indeed, these patterns are actually used quite a lot these days. And so for instance, we have uh, on arrays, we have higher order functions like map. You can map uh, functions over arrays. And of course, if you've ever done some sort of web programming, you know this is a very event-driven style of programming. So you end up registering callbacks all the time. And it's very helpful that you can just register functions as callbacks. Yeah. So, Functions are really pretty well done in JavaScript, and they're sort of the power tool uh, that works in most cases. The second very good part of JavaScript is its support for object-oriented programming, and then in particular the way it deals with sort of uh, objects and object literals. Yeah, so over here on the left, I declare an object called Bob, and Bob has three properties called name, date of birth, and address. As you can see, date of birth and address are nested objects. They are values that are themselves objects, and you can write this down pretty concisely, it all looks pretty clean. And as you can see on the right, you can actually combine objects with functions in clean ways. For instance, I create a function called make point. It takes an i and a j variable, and it, every time you call this function, it'll return to you a fresh object with three properties, x, y, and two string, x and y being just simple data properties, and two string being a method. Yeah. And then at the bottom, you can see that I call make point. I get a point object P. And then I can access the X property or call the two string method with very traditional syntax that you should probably all be familiar with if you've ever coded in C or in uh, Java. Yeah. OK, so JavaScript is also this extremely dynamic language. Some people are heavily in favor of this. Others are uh, more against this. But nevertheless, it's a dynamic language. What do I mean by that? You, in JavaScript, you can do things with objects that are very difficult to do in other languages. Either you can't do them, or you need elaborate reflection APIs to do so. For instance, uh, it's possible in JavaScript to access a property of an object of which you don't know the property name at uh, compile time. Yeah? So at runtime, you can compute a string, and then you can use the square bracket uh, operator to index into an object and retrieve or update properties dynamically. It's also possible in JavaScript to extract methods as functions from objects and then apply them explicitly. I'll go into more detail about that uh, later. Uh, so, so you can do dynamic method invocations. JavaScript even has a for-in loop, which is a statement that you can use to enumerate all the properties of an object. Uh, you can actually do something for every property in an object. In JavaScript, objects are actually flexible bags of properties. And you can actually add new properties at runtime to an object. Uh, if I take the object obj, I can just add a new bar property by assigning some value to it. And it even has a delete operator that allows you to delete existing properties from objects. Yeah. So objects are really these flexible collections, these malleable collections that you can change at will. Now, OK, enough talking about the good parts. Let's see some of the, the bad parts. Uh, one of the worst parts of JavaScript uh, is that it doesn't have a module system. And so this means, for instance, on a web page, if you have multiple script tags, 
And the, the top script tag here is supposed to define some sort of library. Uh, and it binds the public API of the library to an object, to a variable called lib. And the bottom uh, script uh, uses the library. So the way this linkage works in JavaScript is that the, the library actually has to declare a global variable. So lib in this case is global because it's not nested inside of any function. And global variables are just visible throughout your entire program. And that's why your, your bottom script can use the library. Uh, so this works to, to a certain extent, but notice I also declare this variable called x. And again, because the variable is declared at top level, it'll be global variable. And maybe x is some, some, something that the library needs, but is otherwise local to this library. Well, it's not going to be local to the library. Anyone will be able to see x. Yeah. So JavaScript programmers have learned to deal with these, with, for instance, with this defect of the language. And a pattern that you'll often see, a common pattern, is if you, have, if you want to defi define a library, you wrap the library in a function and you apply the function immediately. So over here, I declare, I take the code that was in the library, I nest it inside of a function, and that function, I call it immediately. Yeah, I apply it immediately. So this seems stupid, right? I nest everything in a function, I just apply the function. What's the deal? Well, by nesting this var x statement inside of the function, the variable has now become local to just this library, and any other script on that page will not be able to see that variable. And so you've successfully hidden that variable. And then the function will return an object that is going to be the public API of that library, and only the methods inside of that object will be visible to other scripts. Yeah. So that's one way that JavaScript developers have learned to deal with this. So lib is still a global variable, of course. But of course, these are like well-known global variable names that you use to refer to libraries. They don't at least refer to internals of a library. OK. Another awful part of JavaScript is uh, the with statement. Some of you may have heard of this. Uh, so JavaScript has a, uh, a with statement. It takes an expression that should evaluate to an object. And it takes a block of code. Yeah? And inside that block of code, any identifier that is seen yeah, how is the identifier interpreted? Well, inside of a with statement, if you see an x, you will look it up in the object that comes out of this expression. If that object defines an x property, that will be the value of our identifier. If the object doesn't define an x property, then we'll just look up x in the, in the lexical scope. Yeah. Now, the feature, well, it was designed with, with an express purpose, and it served that purpose well. But in JavaScript, this is a horribly broken feature because it now ties your lexical scoping to the, the object structure, and objects are mutable. So over here, I have an, an example that shows what this, this with statement can do to your code. So I declare a variable called x bound to 42, and an object obj bound to the empty object, uh, just an empty object. And then I, I introduce a with statement with this particular object. I'm going to execute this code here. I'm going to print the value of x. Yeah. So what's going to happen? x is looked up in the object. The object is empty. So we just continue to look up <coughs> outward, and we find x equals 42. And we'll print 42. Yeah. But now, notice in JavaScript, you can just update property, uh, the properties of an object at will. So I will add a new property to the ob object. And now, if I print the value of x, x will be bound to 24. So the same identifier in the same piece of code can mean different things depending on the structure of this object. <coughs> and so we've broken static scoping. JavaScript, just normal JavaScript, does not have static scoping. This is terrible, OK? It's, uh, it hampers the development of code. Uh, if you try to reason about any sort of security in a language where you can't even know what the value of, a, of an identifier will be, well, that's not too good. OK? So there are many more bad parts about JavaScript, and I won't get to all of them today. Let me just mention a few more uh, particularly bad ones. Uh, variable hoisting. So in JavaScript, it looks to have the same syntax that C and Java has. So it seems to support block scoping. But in fact, in JavaScript, any variable that you define at the level of a block, like in the, in the middle of an if test, like in, a, in the then branch of an if test, will actually be global to the whole function. Uh, you think it's local to, the, to that block, it'll be global to the whole function. Uh, implicit type coercions, I don't have to, uh, well, uh, tell you about this anymore. This is all the crazy stuff that you saw in the movie. Yeah? So JavaScript operators, like the plus operator, it tries to convert 
its operands to numbers. So if you try to add two numbers together with the plus operator, you better make sure that the values in there are numbers or you will get crazy results. Uh, something that not too many people know, JavaScript doesn't have integers. Yeah? Anytime you do computations in JavaScript, even though they look like integers, they're actually IEEE 754 double precision floating point numbers. Yeah? Uh, there's other stuff like syntactic stuff like JavaScript will try to be helpful and if you forgot a semicolon, sometimes JavaScript will try to insert a semicolon for you. Now this might actually change the semantics of your program if you're not careful. So these are sort of things that you have to learn to avoid uh, you depending on as a JavaScript developer because they can make your life uh, pretty hard. So that's enough talk about the good parts and the bad parts of the language. Uh, for the, the rest of this first part of the talk, I will delve deeper into some, uh, some aspects of the language. So I will go into a bit more detail on how functions work in JavaScript, on how objects work and object inheritance works, and what exactly a method constitutes in JavaScript. Okay, so <coughs> functions in JavaScript are actually just objects. Yeah. So you, you declare a function called add, it takes two, uh, two parameters and just returns a sum, and you can call that function just like this. Yeah. But actually, functions are objects, and they, have, they can have properties. And in fact, functions have a bunch of methods defined on them, like apply, which is uh, one of the built-in methods defined on functions. And uh, by calling apply, you can actually programmatically call a function where the arguments to the function are stored in an array. Uh, so you can compute the arguments to the function at runtime and then call it. Now, there's this extra parameter here passed to the apply function. Uh, which I bind to undefined in this case. What is that? Well, the first parameter to the apply uh, method is uh, the disbinding of the function. So in, in JavaScript, a function in its function body can refer to a special keyword called this. Yeah? So this function doesn't make use of that. And you can actually set the value of the disbinding by passing an extra parameter to the apply uh, method. Now over here, since that function is not using the this value, I'm passing the undefined value, which is just a simple null value that you can, uh, yeah, that doesn't have any effect. Yeah. But so uh, calling the function like this or calling the function like this is more or less equivalent. Okay, so uh, objects in JavaScript uh, are simple in the sense that you don't need classes. So in JavaScript, you don't declare a class and then instantiate classes. You just declare the objects immediately. Yeah. Uh, there is a sort of class-based pattern that many JavaScript developers use by using a function as an object constructor. Uh, and so the way this works is probably best explained by means of an example. So, over, so I've previously shown you this make point function that you could use to, you know, every time you call the make point function, you got back a fresh point object. Here's another way to accomplish the same example, uh, and probably the more standard uh, way, even though it's a, well, it's a pretty intricate pattern to use. So over here, I have a function called point, and notice the capital P. That's a convention in JavaScript. If you use a function as a constructor, you typically capitalize the first letter. It's not mandated by the language, just good style. Yeah. And the point object is going to initialize a new point instance. So the this binding inside of this function is supposed to point to a new, fresh allocated object. Yeah. And we're going to just store in that new, fresh allocated object an X and a Y property. Yeah. And uh, every, so as I said before, uh, uh, functions, so the point function is actually an object, and there's a particular property of, of uh, function objects called prototype, yeah, that will host sort of, let's say, the shared state of all the objects. So over here, point.prototype points to a little object with a single property called toString, and toString is bound to a function that returns a string representation of the object. Now, if I call this function, and it, I proceed the function call by the new keyword in JavaScript. So this looks very familiar to, to Java programmers, I guess, and that's also how you create new objects in Java. But in JavaScript, the way this works is completely different. If you call a function and you prefix the call with the new keyword, the function is called and it's this binding is set to a new fresh empty object, yeah, P, uh, an empty object. And what's special about that object is that it has a prototype link uh, called underscore underscore proto underscore underscore on some browsers. And that prototype link will point to this point dot prototype uh, object. Yeah? And then by means of these assignments here, the X and the Y properties will, be, will get added to my point object. Now, how does this 
this what does this prototype link mean? What does it do? Yeah. So if you access, if you try to, if you write p dot x, yeah, and you try to look up the x property of the point, that's easy. We just look at the point, we see whether it an, has an x property, and we find it and return one. What if we call the two string method on this point object? Well, we look for a two string over here, and we don't find it. So the prototype link is actually then used to traverse, to go up, and we look for the toString function over here. Over here we find it, and then JavaScript will call that function. And upon calling that function, it'll bind the this binding to the object that originally received the message. And so the this value inside of the function will point to our little p object over here. And that is why when I write this.x, this.y over here, it'll find the right x and y values. Yeah. So this is how this whole sort of example is tied together. So you need functions as constructors, you need the prototype object to store the, the methods, the methods need to use this to refer to the instance state of the object. Pretty complicated, right? To just define a simple abstraction. Okay, so the third uh, aspect I'd like to go into a bit more detail on is uh, functions or methods. Yeah? So in JavaScript, what's the difference between a function and a method? There actually, there is little difference. Uh, in JavaScript, methods are actually just functions that you declare on objects. And perhaps the best difference that I could come up with is if a function mentions the this keyword, then it's sort of supposed to be treated like a method. And if it doesn't mention the this keyword, it's supposed to be treated like a function. Um, so what I already told you on the last slide is that when a function is called as a method, the this keyword is bound to the receiver object. Yeah? So over here, I have another example. I have an object obj, and it has two properties, offset and index. And index is a method. Why? Because it mentions this, uh, this value to get the value of the offset property. It's supposed to be done here. And then we add uh, x to it. So if I call this method like this with this syntax in JavaScript, what JavaScript will do is it'll look up obj.index, it'll find this function, and then it calls the function binding this to the receiver object, obj, which is why this dot offset re returns 10, and 10 plus 0 is uh, 10. Okay, so that's why this method call returns 10. Now, in JavaScript, you can actually extract methods as objects, uh, and uh, sorry, you can extract methods as functions and use them standalone. So over here, I have the same obj object, and over here, what I do is I query the object for its index property, but I, I don't immediately call the method. Yeah? I just look it up. And so obj.index finds this, this index property, and it just returns this function without calling it. And I store this in a variable called indexf. And now I can actually do crazy stuff with this. I can take another object and then assign to its index property this function. Yeah? So you can just copy functions over from one object to another. That's all they're common. Now, something weird is going to go on if I try to call this function normally. Yeah? So just calling it, passing arguments, I will get an error. Why is that? Because in JavaScript, when you try to call this function, JavaScript has forgotten where the function came from and what object the function belonged to. JavaScript doesn't know. And JavaScript is trying to be helpful here. And it's, uh, so it says, what, what value should I bind this to? I don't remember what object it came from. Well, I'll just bind this to the global object. Yeah? So that there's this global object in, in, in every JavaScript environment. And we'll just bind this to the global object. And what's going to happen then is, I this method, when it's run with this bound to the global object, we query this dot offset. Now, assuming that offset doesn't exist on the global object, yeah? let's hope that that's the case, then this dot offset returns undefined. That's another JavaScript quirk. In JavaScript, if you query an object for a property and the object doesn't have that property, then the property lookup just returns undefined. It doesn't throw an error or so, it just returns undefined. But then, because this thing returns undefined, when we then try to add a number to it, now we'll get an error because you can't add anything to undefined. Yeah. So that's why this blows up. So how can we make, make that example still work eh, if we have extracted a method as a function and we still want that function to work normally? Well, we can use this apply function that I've introduced earlier and say, well, I want to call this function. Here are the arguments to the function. And you should use this particular object as it's this value. And now, when I, when I apply this function, I will get back the same result. And things will work out as I, I had expected. Now, it turns out that these kinds of bugs occur surprisingly often in JavaScript. 
uh, up to the point that in ECMAScript 5, so the latest standard, they actually introduced a helper function called bind uh, to help you extract methods from, from objects and then still have them be usable, uh, callable as functions. So what's going on here? I look up the method in the object, so object.index is just going to look, look up this function and return this function, and then bind is a new method defined on functions that takes an object and a function and returns a new function that remembers what object it should use as the value of its this binding. And so index f in this case is what is called a bound function. It's a function that remembers what object it came from. And when I call this, this function with the normal pro, uh, me method invocation syntax in JavaScript, so just calling this function, things will work out. And JavaScript will remember, ah, this index f, it's actually, I should use this object over here as uh, the value of this. And the example will work out again. Yeah? So hopefully this gives you some insight in how JavaScript's object model works. Okay, so to summarize this first part of the talk, um, there's this quote by, by again, by, by Doug Crockford saying that Jav JavaScript is a Lisp in C's clothing. What does he mean by that? Well, JavaScript from the outside to, to a normal developer yeah, who has learned C, who has learned Java, he looks at JavaScript and he says, oh, I know this language, you know, it's just like C, it's just like Java, it has these same statements. Uh, but he's, he's easily fooled. Yeah? Underneath the hood, JavaScript is actually much closer to functional languages like Lisp, yeah? and uh, it's much closer to those kinds of languages than it is to the C and Java style family, even though looks can be deceiving. So, Crockford in his little book uh, calls out the good parts of JavaScript, the things you can rely on, the things you can build large software systems on, and that's really those functions and so those objects that are. That's really pretty good parts, uh, things that are well done, well worked out. There's <coughs> bad parts in the language that, as a JavaScript developer, if you want to become experienced in the language, if you want to become productive in the language, then you have to know about these bad parts and you have to know how to avoid them. Yeah? So, the use of global variables to link scripts, the lack of static scoping, var hoisting, and so on. You need to be aware of those things. Another thing that I've only mentioned implicitly is that there is no way to protect objects from modifications by clients in JavaScript. If I declare an object yeah, that's meant to be some sort of API, and now I want to pass out this object to some third-party library that I don't really trust, yeah, I have no way of protecting my own objects from that third-party code. And the third-party code can just delete all the properties of this object, or it can override all the properties with its own malicious properties. Yeah? So there's no way you can use sh usefully share objects across trust <laughs> boundaries without you knowing that the other guy is just going to go completely destroy your objects. Yeah? So we're going to talk about how ECMAScript 5 solves that in a minute. Okay, so... Any questions about this first part of the talk before I proceed with the second part? Okay. So, the second part of the talk is going to be about ECMAScript 5, which is the latest standard version of JavaScript, and the, the common subset that runs in all major browsers, and its support for strict mode. Yeah. So, ECMAScript is a bit of a funny name, but it's just the name for standard JavaScript. So JavaScript has been standardized since about 97. Yeah? Uh, and uh, since then, it has received two minor updates in, uh, in 98 and 99. And so ECMAScript 3 is sort of the standard JavaScript language that we've been using for about yeah, the last 10 years, let's say. Uh, there was work on a fourth edition, which was supposed to be a major update to the language. Uh, well, that project sort of got sidetracked it went, uh, eventually uh, went nowhere. And then in 2009, the fifth edition was released. And that's actually a very minor update to the third edition. It doesn't add, really, it doesn't add a lot of features. It just consolidated all of the, the extra non-standard stuff that had accumulated in, in browsers since then. That's a fairly minor update. Uh, and then actually, so it was released in December 2009. I would say only in 2012 have we seen widespread support for the full ECMAScript 5 language in all major browsers. So actually today, uh, you can really start depending on ECMAScript 5 across all major browsers, but I think like for instance IE8 and so on uh, still don't have full support uh, for this. And then uh, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have uh, the sixth edition, as it's already, uh, uh, so work on that has already resumed quite far. There's a draft specification out there. Uh, and sixth edition is actually going to be a fairly major update. 
and they're going to uh, there will be classes that will be introduced in JavaScript, a module system that will be introduced in JavaScript. So this sixth edition is really going to be a fairly big update to the language. But uh, it'll take a few years before we can actually start depending on that. So ECMAScript 5 is what we're stuck, stuck with today. And I think if you're today into web application development, you should actually know what ECMAScript 5 has to offer. And ECMAScript 5 added, well, it was a modest update to the language, but still there were quite some updates, and you can sort of categorize them into three major themes. The uh, first theme is new APIs. Uh, second theme is support for more robust programming, which is useful for security. And a uh, third theme was a better emulation of uh, special objects called host objects. I'll get back <laughs> to that in a minute. So first theme is new APIs that were added. Uh, so, uh, for instance, the support for these bound functions that I just talked about, that is new in ECMAScript 5. And another thing that was got standardized in ES5 was JSON. Uh, so how many people here know about JSON? Okay, lots of people, good. So don't have to explain in a lot of detail, but so JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It was invented by Doc Crockford, the same Doc Crockford that wrote this JS The Good Parts book. Uh, and so it's really sort of, it's sometimes called the fat-free alternative to XML because it does everything that XML does, only faster and more lightweight, yeah. Uh, so over here is, for instance, a piece of JSON code. And as you can see, it sort of looks very similar to JavaScript. And that's not a coincidence uh, because JSON is a subset of JavaScript. It uses JavaScript numbers, strings, arrays, and the object notation without the methods, yeah. So a JSON string is also a valid piece of JavaScript. And, well, if you just want to be convinced about how simple JSON really is, I recommend that you visit json.org. And the formal syntax, the formal grammar of JSON literally fits in a margin. Uh, well, if you go to that web page, the formal syntax is just in the margin of that web page. Uh, I really like that. That's really beautiful. Okay. So before ECMAScript 5, you could either parse JSON quickly or you could parse it safely. Uh, the choice was up to you. Because... What I mentioned, what I just mentioned, that J JSON is a subset of JavaScript. So what did, what, what did many developers do? In order to parse JSON, what did they do? They just took the string and called the eval operator. Yeah? So for those of you that don't know, eval is, an, is a function in JavaScript. You give it a string, and it will evaluate, interpret that string as a piece of JavaScript code. And of course, because a JSON string is a valid piece of JavaScript, if you eval it, you get an object structure or an array structure, and you've just parsed the code. Why is this unsafe? Well, if your JSON depends on user input, or, if you, or you get your JSON from a server that you don't trust, who's to say that this JSON string is valid JSON? It might be a full JavaScript script that, that steals your cookies and, or, or sniffs your history and sends them to the highest bill. Yeah. So it's very unsafe to do this kind of thing. So there was a, an actual JSON parser released. Uh, so if you, if you wanted to, to safely parse it, you could do it. But it was, of course, slower because you had to load this library and, and, uh, and you know, evaluate all of this in JavaScript itself. In ECMAScript 5, they added two functions, json.parse and json.stringify. Yeah? So json.stringify takes an object or, or an array, and it produces the, the, the well-formed JSON string. And json.parse only accepts well-formed JSON code and it turns them back into a set of JavaScript objects or, or arrays. Yeah. And this is uh, best of both worlds. It's safe, and it's implemented natively in the browser, so it's fast. OK, so I won't talk about any of the other set of APIs that were added in ES5. I'll jump right ahead to ECMAScript 5 support for more robust programming. Um, so as I said previously, in JavaScript, you had, before ECMAScript 5, you had no way of, or of protecting your own objects when you handed them out to third-party clients. And when you load some library you don't trust and you pass them objects you created, the library can do with whatever it wants. ECMAScript 5 changed this with support for some extra new primitives that allow you to lock down an object. So over here I have an object called point. It's a very simple object with two properties. And over here I'm going to pass that point object to a new method called object.preventExtensions. Now, what does this, this method do? When you pass it an object, uh, this method marks the object as non-extensible. And from that point on, it's no longer possible to add new properties to that object. Yeah? When you try to say point.z equals zero, this will fail. Yeah? You can no longer add your own property. 
Then there is another method called object.seal. Yeah, you give it an object, and object.seal does everything that object.prevent extension does, but it also marks all the individual properties so that you can't delete them anymore. Yeah, so if you've sealed an object, you cannot add properties to it anymore, and deleting existing properties will also fail. Ah, okay, good. That gi also gives us some confidence. Now there's a third primitive called object.freeze. Again, it takes an object, and it does everything that object.seal does, and in addition, it marks all properties as non-writable, so you can't even update them anymore. So now, if you've frozen an object, now clients of the object can really only access the public API of the object, and they can't otherwise tamper with the structure of the object. And it's like uh, a frozen object in JavaScript is sort of like a Java object where all the field, public fields are marked final. Uh, you cannot change it anymore. You can just invoke methods or access the properties, and that's all you can do. And now, with frozen objects, you can actually safely share a frozen object with code you don't trust and, and, and be sure that the, the other objects can only call methods and don't mutate your object on the fly. That's, so that's pretty important. OK, so then the, per, perhaps the biggest change coming in, in, in ECMAScript 5 is its support for strict mode. Not too many people know about this. Uh, but so today, uh, there is actually a safer subset of JavaScript that you can opt into. Yeah. And uh, ECMAScript 5 strict mode, uh, what does it change? Well, first of all, it gets rid of a lot of silent errors. In JavaScript, when things go wrong, when you, for instance, try to delete a property of a frozen object, yeah, then this will just fail uh, silently. You don't get an exception. Yeah. In strict mode, you will get an, a runtime exception uh, that, that's alerting the developer that something has gone wrong. Uh, same thing, uh, so with um, the static scoping rules, in ECMAScript 5 strict mode, you have true static scoping. Yeah. Uh, so no more uh, with style games you can play with identifiers. You have proper static scoping. And it also uh, avoids global object leakage, and I'll explain that by means of an example. OK. Now. Yeah, so what you're saying is, if you want to subvert this system, you, you change the object.freeze primitive before someone gets a chance to use it. That's what you're saying? Yeah, well, uh, at the client side, that they see the object.freeze and just move the, the line, the, the, the line, the, the line code. Well, um, you mean because you send code to the client, the client can do whatever it wants? Yeah, but that, that, okay, so that's sort of a more general issue. Uh, so if you have objects that you ship off to the client, yeah, you're never sure what the client does with that. So, so it doesn't help, I mean, it's not, this is not, a, this, this freeze primitive doesn't help a server that wants to protect its object that it sends off to a client. Uh, that, that, that's not how it works. The scenario that you should more be thinking of is, say I'm writing a sort of a mashup, or like I am, uh, uh, like, I'm embedding a third-party script on my own uh, web page. Now there's like a third-party script that you don't trust and your own code that you trust. Yeah? And you have those, all of those objects live on the client side. But you have some client objects that come from your server that you trust. And you have some objects that come from some other server that you don't trust. That's the scenario where this is useful. Yeah? Um, if we freeze an object but change the prototype, can we Yeah. So, um, in JavaScript, so the way it's sort of currently specified is that, but it, well, it's not yet codified because uh, changing the prototype, well, first of all, changing the prototype of an object is a non-standard thing. So if you look at just purely ECMAScript, yeah, there is no, it doesn't provide any primitive to change the prototypes of objects. Yeah. So in the standard, it doesn't exist, the problem. If you go to, to of course, to actual JavaScript and on most browsers, not all browsers, on some browsers, you can actually update the prototype of an object. But even there, so, well, the goal at least is that on frozen objects, that should fail. Whether or not that's actually the case, it's hard to verify because this is all in non-standard zone. Yeah, so we're operating outside the standard here. Uh, in general, well, if you, if you, uh, I'll explain later when I come to Kaha and SES, how this all sort of ties into a larger framework so the thing is, 
Just freezing your objects won't give you security. Yeah? You need a larger framework like Kaha that secures the whole environment. Uh, for instance, that also makes sure that if you call object.freeze, that it is the real object.freeze and not some, some hack that the client, that some other library has installed. And so there's a bigger picture here, but I will come to that at the end of the talk. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. What, what kind of real security does object freezing and sealing give you? So it gives you, if you have multiple clients, uh, multiple scripts on the client that want to talk to each other, and you have properly configured those, so just programming it in ECMAScript 5 will not be enough. So you will need something like secure ECMAScript, which I will get to later. Yeah? If you have such a setup, yeah, such a, if you configured your page right, then you can safely share objects such that the client, if you pass a frozen object to some third party code, the third party code can only invoke methods on that object and it cannot otherwise tamper with the object or get inside of the object and steal some <coughs> encapsulated data and so on. Uh, it can only call the public API and it cannot get at other values that are protected behind that object. This is good for helping with mashups, basically. Yes, that's one, one use case. Well, I, I, my conjecture is the threat model really is no, the benefits are almost negligible because if we're doing mashups, you basically have cross-site scripting by design. Yes. Which is almost a complete compromise to client anyway, so. Well, that's, I, yeah. I mean, this is neat, but. So, I don't buy this because uh, often when you pass your object to a third party library, then you worry what you could get back. I mean, when the, when the call returns, what's going to happen to your object? Would, would something like freeze? You know, the, 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 the point is that this is only useful when you're in an environment where you have one script and you're allowing a third party like Google Analytics. Yep. To execute a yep. page. Yep. And my, my conjecture is that at that point you're allowing cross-site scripting by design and it came over. And this is good for functionality or using a trusted third-party service, but so it, it, is, is that a fair point? Or? It's a, f a very fair point because at this point I have not yet explained enough mechanism by which you can secure fully secure third-party code. When I get to Kaha and secure ECMAScript, yeah, they provide additional <laughs> mechanisms by which you can actually confine third-party scripts so that you really don't need to trust it and it won't be able to muck about with your cookies and so on. And Kaha is the only mechanism I've seen that does that. Yeah. And then there's uh, uh, Crockford's ad safety right. working on it. It's basically yep. the same thing as Kaha. Yeah, right. Well, it's, it's very similar, right? So yeah, so these kinds of things came up, for instance, with Yahoo and AdSafe. Why was AdSafe designed? Because they wanted to allow JavaScript-based advertisements on Yahoo property. And of course, you're not just going to load any old JavaScript code on your uh, Yahoo container page, uh, so you want to protect that. So that's the kind of thing where this comes up. Okay. All right. So, um, strict mode, yeah? So strict mode is a safe subset of JavaScript. And it's a subset in the sense that you have to explicitly opt into it. And why is that? Because in strict mode, things behave differently than in non-strict mode. And in JavaScript, it's always this big problem of they can't really change the language too much because of backwards compatibility constraints. And no browser vendor is going to risk the fact that because they change their JavaScript engine, existing websites will break. So there's you, this huge com backwards compatibility burden. And the way they, they sort of avoided this in ECMAScript uh, 5 is they, they wanted you to explicitly opt into the, the, the subset. How do you opt into the subset? Well, you, use, you, you put the string uh, so this is a string constant use strict as the first thing at the top of your script or as the first uh, thing at the top of your function body. And this opts either your whole script tag uh, or just this function body into strict mode. So all the code inside of that function body or inside of that script is going to then be in strict mode. Yeah? Um, and it's actually perfectly viable and perfectly normal for strict and non-strict functions to live inside of the same address space, and strict functions can call non-strict functions and otherwise, and that's all perfectly fine. Now, there is one thing that the, the committee sort of discovered after ECMAScript 5 was released, uh, sort of a gotcha uh, that you have to be aware of if you want to develop in strict mode. Uh, so here's a, a sort of top tip. Uh, there's this thing in JavaScript that many, many developers, when they develop JavaScript and they go on and deploy their scripts, on the website, they will minify the JavaScript and sort of stripping out all the white space. And further on, they will concatenate multiple scripts 
Why do they do that? If you don't concatenate your JavaScript code and you say you load 10 libraries, yeah, if you visit the web page, the browser will make 10 individual HTTP GET requests to fetch all of those libraries. So they just concatenate all the, all the JavaScript code into one big file. Now you need to just do one HTTP GET request. Now, if you wrapped it into strict mode by just putting use strict at the top of your script tag, yeah, and now uh, I have some other scripts that follow this, this script tag, and these are not in strict mode. Yeah. Now see what happens if I concatenate uh, if I concatenate the, the scripts by just taking these two script blocks and putting it in, in one script block, and you all see what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, now all of a sudden, this function is also in strict mode. So I've just implicitly opted into strict mode. Well, and the problem is strict mode is not backwards compatible, so now your site can break and you don't know what caused this. So, what do people recommend? Well, uh, it's sort of the same trick that you've seen before to deal with global variables. The trick is to, instead of uh, putting your code just in a script type, you wrap it in a function body and you call the function immediately. Uh, so it's sort of, again, this useless trick of just putting in a function, calling it immediately. And uh, so what that does is if you concatenate the two scripts now, now the use strict will only opt this function body into strict mode and it will not affect you. It's sort of like it's modularizing your strict mode opt-in. You have to be careful though, because this transformation of taking arbitrary JavaScript code and wrapping it in a function, uh, it might actually change the behavior of your program. For one thing, all the vars, yeah, if you had variable declarations here, they will no longer be global. They will be local to the function. Yeah? So these are things that you need to be, uh, <coughs> that you need to be aware of. Um, but still, so that's a, that's a, that's a particular painful gotcha. Uh, okay, so I mentioned earlier that ECMAScript 5 non-strict is not statically scoped. And you had these weird tricks with, with that could uh, change the meaning of an identifier. And there's actually, in, in full JavaScript, there's four violations of static scoping. Uh, first of all, there's this particular nasty one where if you declare a variable inside of a function like x foo with a uh, low, lowercase foo, and now you assign to a variable with an uppercase foo, ah, just a little typo. JavaScript will try to be helpful again, and it'll just assign uh, x foo to a new global variable. Yeah. So it just created the global variable out of thin air. Oh, great. Uh, so we have the with statement. I already explained that. Uh, there's the delete statement, which you can use to delete properties off of objects, but you can actually also just delete variables. Yeah. It's totally crazy. You can just say delete x, and now the x variable is, is, is gone. And uh, even more crazy is that you can evaluate strings like var x equals eight, and this will introduce a new, uh, a new variable called x in your in your static scope. So the, all of these things they mess about with your your static scope, and you need to get rid of them if you want true static scope. So how does strict mode uh, get rid of those cases? Well, by simply opting into strict mode, just by putting that use strict string in front of your uh, code. Uh, all of the following pieces of code become syntactically illegal. Eh? So it means that you will get a syntax error. You don't even need to run the code to figure out that something has gone wrong. This can all be checked statically. What is that? Well, the with statement is just forbidden. Yeah? So the, the strict mode does not have a with statement. Uh, deleting variables is totally forbidden. You can still delete properties off of objects. So you can say delete obj.x, that works. But just deleting variables, that, no, that's a no-go. Yeah, that won't work. Uh, other stuff like if you define properties with duplicated parameter names, in ECMAScript 3 this all works fine and you won't get any errors. Well, you, get, you will get very weird behavior, but uh, you won't get any errors. In strict mode, you will complain saying uh, this is an error. Same thing with if you repeat the same uh, formal parameter name twice, you will get an error. Um, uh, what else? So. Uh, what do you think this does? Yeah. Var n equals zero to three. What do you think that the value of n will be? Yeah, it'll be 19. <laughs> so many people would have the, the right expectation that n should be equal to 23. It'll be equal to 19 because it's an octal literal. Uh, this is sort of a rem remnant from the old C age. Uh, so in, in strict mode, you can't use octal literals because it's just too confusing. Uh, you also can't use eval as the name of a variable, also too confusing. Don't do that. Yeah. So strict mode is actually just all the things that are just plain insane in JavaScript it gets rid of, which is good. Uh, so that's, that's the, 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 the static stuff. There's also some runtime changes, and this is why opting into strict mode, uh, it's, it's 
uh, it requires that you carefully test your existing code because it might change the behavior. Uh, so for instance, uh, assigning to this unexisting variable, uh, the typo case, in normal JavaScript, this will create a new xfoo variable in the global scope. In strict mode, this will throw an error. Yeah. So that's the same alternative, it will throw an error. Uh, same thing if you try to delete properties from objects that you cannot delete, like I've frozen an object, that point is a frozen object, and I try to delete the x property. In JavaScript, this fails silently. In strict mode, you'll get an, a runtime exception. Okay. Uh, then this global object leakage, what's that about? So over here, I have my little point constructor function that I explained previously. And I call, when I call this point object with a new keyword, everything works out as expected. Everything uh, works fine. But it's an extremely common bug in JavaScript that you forget the new keyword and you just call the point constructor without the new keyword. So what do you think will happen? Well, in JavaScript, again, JavaScript calls this function and it doesn't know what this value to use, so it tries to be helpful and it, uh, it substitutes this for the global object. And the global object is called window in, uh, in the browser. Uh, so when it executes this, this function body, it'll e actually execute the, the statements window.x equals 1, window.y equals 2. Uh, and in doing so, you've actually created new global variables x and y. So now when I try to print the value of x, all of a sudden there's this new property called uh, x, which is bound to 1. Uh, this is clearly horrible. Uh, uh, so if you just opt into strict mode, and you, we execute the same example, yeah? so if you use the new operator, things work out fine as, as before. But if we call the point object, uh, sorry, the point function without the new keyword, in strict mode, uh, JavaScript will say, well, I will not bind to this value to the global object, I will just bind to this value to undefined. And now, uh, when, when we execute this function body, we'll actually, actually execute, uh, when I say this.x equals x, we'll say undefined.x equals 1, and this fails immediately <coughs> because you cannot add properties to undefined. So over here we get totally erratic behavior, and here we get a same runtime exception. Yeah. So uh, one final change, uh, this one is actually not dependent on strict mode, so this, is, this has changed both in strict and non-strict mode. In ECMAScript 5, ECMAScript distinguishes between using eval as an operator and eval, using eval as a function. Uh, what's the difference? Over here, I use eval, I call it directly. And so if I declare a variable called x, a local variable called x, and then I say eval x equals 5, and then I ask what is the value of x, it'll say 5. <coughs> uh, because I've evaluated the string, and this string is evaluated in this local scope, so it sees this x value and it updates it. Now, if I start to do crazy stuff, like, for instance, bind eval to a function f, and then call the function f, so now it's no longer statically visible that I'm actually, you know, evaluating this string. Uh, what JavaScript in ECMAScript 5 does is it will actually evaluate this string not in the local scope, but in some other scope, in a global scope. And now uh, when I assign x to 5, it'll, it'll not touch my local x and my local x is unaffected. Yeah, so that's some, a difference in using eval that's pretty important. And the reason why this is important is because we can now guarantee uh, uh, proper static scoping as long as you don't use eval inside of your function body. Okay, so the last uh, set of changes that happened in ECMAScript 5 was that they added better support for the emulation of host objects. Now what are host objects? These are simply objects that are provided to JavaScript scripts by the host platform. And what is the most common host platform? It is the web browser. What are the most common host objects? That's the objects that comprise the DOM or document object model. Uh, this is this document and window. They give you access to this tree representation of the HTML page. And the, the, the funny thing about these, these objects is that they look and feel like normal JavaScript objects, but they're actually not implemented in JavaScript itself. They're actually typically implemented in C++, which is the language that browsers are implemented in these days. And because of this, they can actually have very weird behavior that you can never fake or never emulate with JavaScript objects themselves. And this is troublesome because it means that if a document object model has a bug, you cannot create a library that fixes the bug and uh, behaves the same way as the, the real document object model does. Now in ECMAScript 5, there is a support added like accessor properties and property attributes. So I won't go into detail, just suffices to say that with those features, 
JavaScript developers now have much better ways of emulating the document object model in JavaScript itself. And ECMAScript 6, so the, the next standard version of the language, goes even further than this, uh, and it adds proxies which allow you to, to even better emulate these host objects. And that's going to be the subject of the third part of my talk. Are there any questions at this point for the second part? Okay, so then I'll continue straight away with um, ES6 proxies. So what are proxies? They're objects that look and feel like normal JavaScript objects, but whose behavior is actually controlled by some other JavaScript object. So they're part of a new and upcoming reflection API for ECMAScript 6. And for those of you that are Java developers, they're sort of like the Java Lang Reflect proxies, uh, but then sort of on steroids. So who, who here is familiar with Java's dynamic proxies? Anyone? Java Lang Reflect proxy? So Java Lang Reflect proxy, does that ring a bell to anyone? Some people. Oh, it's, a, it's a, uh, from the reflection API. Yeah. To introspect into different classes and objects. Yeah, it allows you to sort of create your own custom classes that implement a certain interface, but you get to intercept all method calls. Keynote, this is disabled by default when you turn on the, when you turn on the Java Security Manager. Well, that's one of the main uses of the Java Security Manager is to shut off by default. I didn't know about that. No. Which almost no one uses, so I digress. Well, I'm not sure. I, I actually thought it was, for instance, Java RMI relies on uh, these proxies since 1.5. Right. But that's only when you install a security manager, right? Right. Only yeah. it's, uh, Which is for the, the for the minority, uh, I mean. When you try to reflection and the attacker can get any kind of access to your system, it's game over. Yep. Because of this. Okay. So, um, why do you want something like a, a, a proxy mechanism? There are a couple of use cases I've already mentioned, you know, better support for emulating host objects. Uh, why is that? Because now, if you can emulate the, the browser document object model faithfully in JavaScript itself, you can actually implement the DOM in JavaScript, and now you can you could provide a virtual document object model to third-party scripts. And that's exactly something like uh, that technology like Kaha uh, does. Now, there's also another sort of more general reason why you would want something like proxies, which is that they allow you to implement generic access control wrappers. Uh, for instance, stuff like revocable references, and I'll give a, 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 a much more detailed example uh, later on. <laughs> so uh, let's start with a simple example of uh, using proxies. So over here I have another make point function, very standard. I take a few uh, uh, variables and I return a new object, uh, a point object with x and y properties. I call the make point function, I get back a point object. Now, the goal here is to create a trace here so that every time I do something via a trace point, it'll create a log of all the operations that were performed on the object. So I need to intercept all those operations. So what I do is I call this make, a make tracer function, the definition of which I'll so show in a minute. You pass it an object, <laughs> any object, and it'll give you back a traced version of the object. And now anything you do with the trace point, like accessing a property or updating a property, will get logged and it'll behave as normal. Yeah. So it's transparent to the user. The user doesn't see that stuff gets logged. To, it, to the user, it just appears like a normal point object. But behind the scenes, these operations are trapped. And you can do security checks, or you can do logging, or all sorts of stuff. So the question is, how do you implement this make tracer function? So in, uh, in, in JavaScript or in ECMAScript 6, there's a new uh, constructor function called proxy, which allows you to create new proxy objects. And the proxy is a function of two arguments. So the first argument is the object to which you want to create the proxy, and the, the object for which the proxy is a proxy. And the second argument to the proxy constructor is an object, so with the, denoted by the, the, the curly braces here, and that object implements a special protocol, a special set of methods like, with names like get and set, and these methods are called traps because they will be methods that get invoked when a certain operation occurs on the proxy. So the proxy constructor returns proxy object, that's the object that will eventually return from this method. And anything that we do with this proxy object will intercept one of these methods. Yeah? So there's a get method that intercepts property accesses, so we just do the logging, and then we forward the operation 
to the target object. And same thing for setting. This will get called when I try to update a property on the object. I log the, the, the operation and I forward the operation. I just perform the operation that I just intercepted on my target object. Yeah, so there's, there's two objects at work here. Uh, there's the proxy object, which is the object that my clients will interact with. And then there's this special dedicated handler object, which sort of lives at a, at a, a separate level, which implements this, this whole new API of methods that allow you to intercept everything that happens to this object. Yeah? And then there's this third object, uh, the target. So the proxy itself points to this target object. And anything that you don't want to intercept, uh, so for any operation that you don't provide a method, the proxy will just by default forward all the operations that it intercepts to its target object. Okay, so how you should imagine that, uh, that proxies work is every time you see code such as this, uh, so we're accessing the full property on a proxy object, at runtime what will happen is that this code gets evaluated or interpreted as follows. We call the get trap on the handler object and we pass it the target object as the first parameter and the string foo so that then uh, it's up to the handler to then fit in the get trap, do whatever it wants <coughs> to evaluate that piece of code. Yeah. Similarly, if we have a property update, this will trigger a different trap, the set trap, that allows us to override uh, property lookup, uh, sorry, property update on this proxy object. Um, Method invocation, if we, if we invoke the foo method on the proxy, how will that work? Well, in JavaScript, as I've mentioned in depth previously, uh, method invocation is a two-step process. You first look up, do a get, to find the foo property on the proxy, and that thing should return a function that then gets applied to the actual arguments, which are put in an array, and the disbinding inside of the, the method will be bound to the proxy object itself. And finally, and this may be a bit surprising, so what happens if I write proxy.get? Yeah? So people might think that proxy.get gives me access to these trap functions. That's actually not the case. Uh, if I write proxy.get, I'll call the get trap on the handler, and the name of the property that I'm intercepting just happens to be named get. So what you see here is that there's a clear separation between the interface of the proxy object and the interface of the handler. And there is no collusion here, which is why we call this a stratified API. Yeah? There's, no, there's a clear stratification between what the proxy does and what the handler does. Um, and just uh, so you don't think that you can only intercept uh, property access and property updates, you can actually intercept almost everything that you can do with a JavaScript object, you can intercept with these proxies. For instance, JavaScript has an in operator. It takes a string and an object, and it tells you whether or not the object has that property. So this will trigger a, a, a different trap called uh, has that allows you to intercept that operator. The delete operator, if you try to delete a property from a proxy, that'll also trap as a separate dedicated uh, a method. Uh, even the for in loop, if you try to enumerate all the properties of an object, that'll actually trigger another trap. So it allows you to control the for in loop on proxies. Yeah. So you can trap almost everything. So here's an example use case that might come up in a, in a sort of security context uh, where you're defining a security policy that you, you have a target resource and you want to hand out access to that resource, but you don't want clients to have direct access to the, to the target resource. You give them out a, a revocable reference proxy and uh, the goal being that at a certain point in time when your client doesn't need the resource anymore or when you deem that the client doesn't need the resource anymore, you revoke that reference and now the client is left with a dangling pointer and it cannot access the resource anymore. So over here is a piece of API code. Uh, so how interacting with, sh with such a reference might look like. So we have our target resource. We call it a function called make revocable, which gives us back a reference. And this reference is actually just a tuple of two things. We can, uh, from the reference, get at a proxy. So ref.proxy gives us this proxy object that we then can pass to client code. And because of the way this proxy mechanism works, the client doesn't actually know that it's handed the proxy. Huh? To the client, it's as if it's gotten access to the real target because everything it does to the proxy is just forwarded to the target transparently. Yeah. But then there's also this uh, revoke method defined on this reference. And when, when, when I, the creator of this revocable reference, uh, 
invoke this revoke method, the link between the proxy and the target is severed, and now every, everyone that only has a reference to the proxy can no longer access the target resource. Okay? So I have a little uh, small demo over here uh, that I can use to demonstrate this. Uh, so the way I've set up this little system here is, um, so I've got a piece of code that I've labeled as trusted. That's supposedly the code that created this, this, this page. Yeah? And uh, there's a piece of untrusted code that you've loaded from somewhere. And I've given it the ability to log to the console. Yeah? So let me just um, show the JavaScript console. Yeah? And now whenever I press this, this button over here, uh, the code just logs uh, an ever-increasing number to the console. Yeah, very simple. It just shows that the code has access to the console. Now, my trusted code has a button here, revoke access to console. When I press that, yeah, it now has severe the link with this proxy. And now my client, whenever it still tries to access that, that uh, console, it'll get an error saying, uh, sorry, your access was revoked. Yeah. And uh, I'm not going to go into the full uh, source code over here, but just uh, to show you that uh, over here, so this is this make revocable function that was on my slide, and my third party code, which I just you know, uh, model here as a simple function, takes this console as an argument, and it uses the console just like it would use the real console. Yeah? So that's the gist of it. Yeah? To, the, to, the, to this third party code, it doesn't know that it has only given, uh, given, been given a temporary access to the console. Yeah? And so over here at the bottom, I revoke access to the console, and that's what causes this, uh, this error behavior. OK. <clears throat> so uh, maybe I should explain the make revocable function, uh, because it's such, a, such, such an easy function to explain. So uh, make revocable, uh, you give it this target resource that you want to protect. And the function itself returns an object with two properties, proxy and revoke. Now, the function itself encapsulates a little local variable called enabled, which is set to true initially, meaning initially my revocable reference is active. And this re revoke function, all it does is set this enabled variable to false. Yeah. And the proxy object itself is one of these special proxy objects. It's a proxy for our target resource. And it overrides this, this get trap. So this intercepts method invocations such that uh, uh, whenever uh, a property is looked up on the proxy, this function will get called. And what does the function do? It just says, well, if I'm enabled, then I will just uh, look up the property on the real object. And if I'm not enabled, then I'll just throw, throw an error. Yeah. So this is the code that was responsible for the behavior that you just saw in, uh, in the demo. Uh, so, as I said before, uh, proxies are something that is going to be up and coming in the next version of, uh, of uh, JavaScript, in the next standard, but you already saw me using it in Chrome. Uh, so actually, uh, the good thing about proxies is that they are available in Firefox uh, by default, in Node.js if you pass a special command line parameter, and in Chrome if you enable an experimental flag in Chrome flags. Yeah, so they're still hidden behind an experimental flag. Uh, now, the, the libraries that you will find that shipped with browsers today, they act are actually behind the standardization process. If you want to be absolutely sure that you're losing the latest definition of the standard as it is currently in the draft ECMAScript 6 standard, I've created a little library called reflect.js. It's available for download on GitHub. If you download that script and you include it in your web page, then the script makes sure that your proxy API is up to date with the latest uh, ES6 uh, standard. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about proxies. So now for the final part of my talk, which is about Kaha and uh, secure ECMAScript. So what is Kaha? It's a Google product that basically enables you to safely embed third-party active content in your web page. Yep. Google open source project. Google open source project, indeed. And um, so according to Mark Miller, who is the, the lead designer uh, of uh, Kaha, it's currently being used to protect two Google properties, at least uh, Google Sites. So all, the so all the websites hosted under sites.google.com. 
uh, it used to be the case that they couldn't include JavaScript in their web pages. Now they can, as long as it's in the secure dialect provided by Kaha. And then there is Google Apps Scripts. So you all probably know Google Docs and the Google Spreadsheet and so on. And uh, of course there as well, and just like back in the days with Microsoft Office that, that you could script your, your, uh, your Office op uh, applications with VBScript, now in Google Apps Scripts you can take your Google Spreadsheet and add your own custom functions or widgets as long as they are written in this uh, secure dialect uh, called uh, Kaha or secure ECMAScript. Uh, so the more general use case here is, uh, so when does this come up? Embedding third-party active content if you have some sort of social site, you embed some sort of gadgets or widgets. Um, and of course, you don't want third-party code that is being loaded uh, by third parties to compromise the, the host page and the hosting page or compromise any of these other gadgets. Yeah. So you want to protect the host page and, the other, and each of the gadgets from the other ones. So Kaha is not a traditional sandbox in the sense that Kaha compiled code is actually safe to inline directly in a web page div element. Yeah. So there's no iframes involved, no web workers whatsoever. And this is all, uh, so the third party script is directly embedded inside the div in your web page, and you can directly share object pointers with the untrusted third party script. Yeah. Um, so obviously this is great for writing mashups. If you have multiple third party scripts that you want to communicate, then Kaha is pretty good for that. And it actually, Kaha actually protects the host page from the embedded third party content. So this embedded app can't redirect the host page to some phishing sites or steal cookies from the host page and so on. Yeah. Now, uh, so how does Kaha do that? Uh, so when, when Kaha loads third party code, uh, it puts the code inside the div and the code inside the div doesn't have direct access to the real document object model of the hosting page. It actually only has access to uh, what Kaha calls defensive objects or tamed objects. They're actually a sort of proxy objects for the real document object model. And for instance, Kaha can ensure that if, you're, if this third party script renders things, yeah, that it renders only inside of its own div. And to the third party script, it's as if it's talking to the real document object model, but it's actually talking to a fake document object model provided by Kaha. Okay. Um, so I can maybe do a, a very brief uh, uh, tour of uh, the Kaha apps, uh, uh, the Kaha playground. So if you go to kaha.appspot.com, there's a little play playground where you can play around uh, with uh, Kaha. So over here I have a piece of uh, code. It's HTML code with embedded uh, JavaScript scripts and embedded CSS. And um, so if I uh, press Kahol here, uh, it renders the code. So this is this clock is animated by a JavaScript script, yeah? so it's active content. Uh, but you could embed this active content safely in your web page. Now, if I look at the output of the Kaha compiler, I don't see anything because it's running in ES5 mode. And in ECMAScript 5, Kaha can actually ensure that your code is compliant with the Kaha system without having to do a source-to-source -source compilation of JavaScript. There's also a mode called ES5 over 3. Uh, for older browsers that don't yet support ECMAScript 5. And if I enable that mode, and I then try to uh, uh, cahole the, uh, the code, it's going to take it quite a while longer. Uh, and that's because now it has to do a full source-to-source -source rewrite. So it took that, that source code that I showed earlier, and it it's rewrote it in a horrible uh, way, as you can see. Uh, it's much much bigger code, much larger code, and it mangled all the symbols. And that's just to make sure that this JavaScript code obeys the rules of, uh, of the Kaha uh, subsystem. Okay. So the big benefit is on ECMAScript 5 browsers, which is all the modern browsers, you don't need a full source to source translation, so it's much faster. And Kaha actually consists of three things. Uh, so the first thing, and, and the thing that I want to talk about a bit more, is uh, the secure JavaScript subset, so capability secure JavaScript subset it's called SES, secure ECMAScript. So that's, that's one important part of it. The second part of it is called Domado, and Domado is a safe DOM wrapper. So this is this whole virtual document object model that you provide to third party scripts. And then there's also an HTML and a CSS sanitizer, because if you have a full 
HTML script. Yeah, as you probably know, you can hide little JavaScript scripts in many places in HTML. Same thing for CSS. So the sanitizer needs to make sure that all the scripts embedded in an HTML or CSS style file are actually properly transformed and uh, conform to the, to, the, to the Kaha subset. So SES is the portion of Kaha that is responsible for securing JavaScript. And yeah, so Mark Miller is currently actually pushing secure ECMAScript as a sort of independent standard, independent of the Kaha, uh, the Kaha system as a whole. Um, so we have this, if looking back, we sort of, uh, in order to achieve uh, any form of security at the client side in JavaScript, a lot of things had to be added. Yeah? So starting from ECMAScript 3, which is the, the platform that browsers have been supporting since many years now, ECMAScript 5 adds support for tamper-proof objects. That's this object.freeze. Yeah? That's the thing you need to be able to safely share objects across trust boundaries. Then there's ECMAScript 5 strict mode, which adds proper support for static scoping to your language, which you need to actually properly encapsulate variables in uh, lexical scope. Yeah? So secure ECMAScript is actually a library defined on top of ECMAScript 5 strict mode. And it further adds support for confinement, meaning that if you load third-party code, you don't want that third-party code to just be able to have all the power of your own code. You want it to confine itself to just its own div element. Um, so SES is a library that, that's implemented on top of ECMAScript 5 strict. If you're only interested in SES and not in the full Kaha system, there's this particular script called start SES, which you can include in your web page and that script will actually try to, to tra transform your JavaScript frame or your, your web frame into uh, an SES conformant frame or it will uh, die trying if it fails to secure your, your code because you're running on a non-conformant browser. Um, so what does this little start SES script do? Uh, in other words, how does secure ECMAScript differ from a standard ECMAScript 5 strict environment? And the first and most important uh, thing that uh, Start SES does is it deep freezes the whole global environment. Yeah. Uh, so in JavaScript, when a script loads, it has access to many objects by default, like object, array, function, math, JSON. So there's many objects that you can just use as a JavaScript script. Now, by default, all of these objects are mutable. Yeah? So that means if, if, if you load third-party code, the first thing that third-party code might do is totally screw up all of those global properties. Right? It might totally poison them with its own properties. And that's coming also back to your question. What stops a third-party script from redefining object.freeze so that it doesn't do what you think it does? Well, secure ECMAScript uh, guards against that by just freezing that whole global environment. So it all becomes immutable. Yeah? So third-party code cannot change that, <laughs> that, that environment anymore. The second thing that secure ECMAScript does is it whitelists the global environment. So SES has a, a large whitelist of properties that it allows to exist in the global environment and those that it doesn't allow by default. And in particular, there's uh, these special, uh, probably if you're, if you're on some web development, you know about these like document and window and XML HTTP request. There are these global properties that exist in JavaScript that give you access to the web page or that allow you to send messages to your server and so on, powerful objects. SES uh, disables these by default so that if you load third party code, the code can't actually do anything. Yeah? It, it doesn't have access to XML HTTP requests so it can't send messages to the server. Yeah? Of course, you as the entity that spawns a third party script have the power to provide selective access to some of those things. Yeah? So it might, you might say, well, I load this third-party script, and the script doesn't need access to my document, but I will give it selective access to the XML HTTP request object. That is perfectly fine. And then, uh, well, there's many more things that, S that start SES does, but one of the other important things is that it, it patches the eval function so that if your third-party code itself loads more third-party code using the, the, the eval operator, for instance, then that third-party code should conform to the same rules as as that, own ter that other third party code. Eh? So you cannot use eval to escape all the rules that SES applies. Eh? So eval is patched so that any string that you evaluate in, inside of that eval function will itself be in secure ECMAScript. Okay, so 
how do proxies feature in this grander scheme of things? Well, Kaha uses a an access control paradigm called object capabilities. And uh, um, uh, what are object capabilities? Well, in the object capability paradigm, objects or programs are born powerless unless we give them explicit references to more, more powerful objects. Yeah? And it's very common in such a setup that you don't provide direct access to the powerful objects to untrusted code, uh, but instead your untrusted code is loaded and is given references to proxies to the real resources. Yeah? And this gives you this extra layer of indirection. Uh, as Bart Grenell already said, there is no problem in computer science that you cannot solve with an extra level of indirection and that proxies are that extra level of indirection. Because now, for instance, you can install a security policy saying that uh, after some while, the untrusted code cannot access the target anymore, and you can do that by shutting off this, uh, this link by shutting down the proxy. Uh, so that's the revocable references that we've seen, uh, that we've seen earlier. Uh, there's also going like an even more advanced pattern of security policy are called membranes. What's a membrane? Membrane is a transitively revocable reference. Uh, so just to give you uh, some context, uh, we're in, inside of a single SES frame, and the green objects are sort of your, your own trusted objects, and the black objects are objects that you load from untrust, untrusted uh, third-party sites. Yeah. And now you want to wrap those untrusted uh, objects inside of a membrane so that later on you can make sure that the code cannot affect the, the, the frame anymore. So what I do is I wrap my code inside a membrane and now I color this link, this link purple. That means that this, this pointer is actually a pointer to a proxy to this black object. Yeah? Now, the, the interesting thing about a membrane or where a membrane differs from a the simple revocable reference that I showed earlier is if this object sends a message, uh, invokes a method on this object and it passes as a parameter one of its own objects, then the membrane will intercept that message uh, sent and it will make sure that the untrusted code doesn't receive a direct reference to my uh, object, but it receives one of these revocable references again. And now, similarly, uh, if my third party uh, code that I don't trust creates more objects and it parameter passes those objects, they will stay revocable references. And also, the other way around, if my, my uh, untrusted code sends back messages to my trusted objects and it passes, parameter passes, untrusted objects, yeah, those objects themselves will also get wrapped in proxies. And so all of these pointers that cross this little membrane here, yeah, they're proxies. And with a single stroke, with a single, by just saying revoke or close the membrane, yeah, if I do that, what, what the effect will be is that all the pointers, all the proxies uh, that cross the, the membrane will get disabled, as I've shown you in the demo previously. And in one stroke, what has happened is I've completely segregated this subset of uh, this subgraph of objects that I don't trust, even in such a way that the garbage collector knows that there are no more pointers in or out, and the garbage collector can just reclaim my uh, untrusted third-party code, and I can be sure that my third-party code cannot influence the host page anymore. Yeah. So that's an example of an advanced uh, policy that you can express with uh, proxies. Okay, so it's about time for me to wrap up. And uh, so just to summarize my, my talk a bit, so I've talked about JavaScript, the good, the bad, the strict, and the secure parts. Uh, so I have started with ECMAScript 3, sort of the standard plain vanilla JavaScript, which this book is about. Uh, and I've talked to you about some of the features that are really good about JavaScript and some of the features that, that you should avoid. Then there's ECMAScript 5 and ECMAScript 5 strict mode, which are fairly recent. And I've talked about some of the new, the latest additions that you can rely on uh, today. And finally, I've ended with secure ECMAScript, which is this library on top of ES5 strict, which really allows you to embed third-party active content safely on your web page. Now, it's been a long talk, but what are the few key take-home messages that I want you uh, to, uh, to take home from this talk? Well, the first is that Secure ECMAScript, uh, understand that this SES builds on top of ECMAScript 5 strict mode. That means if you want your code to work together with these tools, or if you want your code to be securable, then opt your code into strict mode. Yeah? So it's not only for security purposes that you should do this. I hope 
that I have convinced you that strict mode is just a saner subset of the language where many things that you, as a normal developer that you would expect are true in strict mode and are uh, totally different in uh, non-strict mode. And then the whole, this whole idea behind these proxies is that they are sort of like a power tool that allow you uh, to express fine-grained security policies such as these revocable references or these membranes. Uh, once you have such a secure container installed, such a secure ECMAScript frame, then you can start using proxies to express fine-grained security policies. Um, so I'm just going to end with some references, uh, also things that I've used to construct this talk. Uh, so there's, again, the book by Doc Rockford. Again, if there is a single book that you, that, that you should read about JavaScript, then it's this one. It's very thin. You can probably read it in an afternoon. Uh, Rockford also has... Um, a couple of YouTube uh, talks, and there's a link to a playlist here uh, of uh, a number of lectures where he, he talks about all of this stuff. It's uh, very warmly recommended. And then there's also uh, so some references to other talks by people on, on ECMAScript 5, Kaha, SES proxies, or if you're really interested in the, the very latest developments on ECMAScript uh, 6. And so with that, uh, the talk is finished, and thanks a lot for your attention.